Where are we at today? I mean, I've been in business for over 40 years, seen a lot in terms of the last real recession after the 87 stock market crash and the ramification. That was the last big recession Australia's had. And it's been fortunate that we've got through, went through the GFC far better than any other um, country but I can't remember in my 40 odd years the complicated dynamics impacting the global economies. No longer is it our backyard and Joe's backyard, Western Sydney, and your backyard, most of you here, Western Sydney. Unfortunately, you are in Western Sydney, let me tell you. It's probably the only area that's got multi-billions of dollars committed for infrastructure between new airports, new roads, new housing, decentralisation of um, large industries, government bringing out um, workers to the West that needs housing, needs office space. But as I said, I can't remember the different dynamics. It's quite amazing. No longer is your backyard the Greater West, no longer is it Sydney, no longer is it Australia. It's globally. Have a look what's happening. The Eurozone in heaps of trouble. And it could take decades, decades, for it to get back up and running. Big economies that are standing in quicksand. Have a look at North America. Thankfully, North America is now starting to get back on its feet and the world needs it because it's still the largest economy in the world. Have a look at how the markets react. Last night, Wall Street. Last night in the UK, the FTSE. The FTSE went down 2.5%. And the Dow dropped just under 2%. And why did it drop? It effectively sold off on the back of good news. Work that one out. Because the, job, the jobless numbers came in above expectations in terms of less people unemployed, that sent a signal saying, oh, the Federal Reserve's going to increase interest rates sooner than what we thought. Huge sell-off on equities on the back of good news. And of course, when Wall Street sells off and the UK sells off, that has impact right through the world. And you say, well, hang on, what does this mean? Look what's happening in China. China has been the big driver of our economy because we've historically been a commodities country relying on the bulk of our exports to China. China's going through a flat spot, and if soft data comes out from China, well, that means soft economy for Australia because we rely so dependent. Australia is what we've got under the ground. We are blessed with natural resources, iron ore, coal, gas, but we need buyers. So you've got to factor that in. So you have a look around the world from China, India, Eurozone, uh, North America, and you look at how does all this impact on our economy? It's not a matter of how our how employment's going, um, 
how our mining industry is going. It's trying to work out what all these other dynamics in different parts of the world means. One thing's for certain, and on the one hand it's very, very positive, on the other hand it's a symptom of an, eco an economy that's not heading in the right direction, and that's interest rates. Absolutely for sure, we will enjoy low interest rates for a lot longer than what was thought. I think the Reserve Bank should have dropped again um, last week because it's the Reserve Bank's job to try to get the economy on an even keel and help promote confidence. They cut in Feb where 90% of the market said no, there won't be a cut yet and they cut. 90% of the market said they'd cut again last month and they didn't cut. And it's sort of like a bit of a, it sort of cynically sort of sounds like, is this a game of try and guess? They've got to instill confidence and they made a decision, we needed to cut rates, we need to improve confidence, let's let the business community and Australians know that we're moving into a stage where we want to give this economy a kick along, more confidence and we'll cut a couple of times. Personally, I think there'll be at least another cut and that'll probably happen over the next month or two. And unfortunately, and I will say unfortunately, there will be, I think, another cut. You know, people often come up to me and say, why is our interest rate so high? I mean, a zero in Europe and a zero in North America, we should be zero. And I look at them and I say, pray that we never get there. And they look at me. I said, because if we get there, you probably won't have to worry about your mortgage because you won't be able to afford to pay your mortgage because you won't have a job. We've got to hope that interest rates start to dribble up gradually, gently, because that's a signal that our economy is on the way to health and things are starting to happen and the, the heart's starting to beat. When it goes the other way, it said we're more sick. We're more sick and then you get so low you're in intensive care. Our economy doesn't want to get there. So I hope we don't see more drops, but I think unfortunately the global dynamics impacting on the local dynamics will force the Reserve Bank to cut further. But you have a look at where liquidity is at the moment, and unless you're in mum and dad housing, it's still very hard to source funding because banks want as much bread and butter housing to get people into houses and investors. Um, they feel that that's safe, spread the risk, and the banks at the moment are tripping over themselves. I haven't seen in 40 odd years in, in housing and finance, I've never seen a competition for mum and dad housing from the banks. Fortunately, I haven't seen any act where banks are, are dropping their standards to win business because APRA, I know, is in there having a very, very close look. APRA is concerned about the high level of investor borrowings. I was stunned to see that there was something like 43% of all new housing loans to owner-occupiers paying interest only. They should ban that. If an owner-occupier who's not a, they, you know, the house isn't their business, if they can't pay back a bit of principal with the lowest interest rates in Australia's history and are taking an interest only loan out when interest rates are like 4.5%, how are they going to pay principal back if it goes to 6%, 7%? So that is one statistic that I was stunned at. 43% of all owner-occupiers taking loans. So let me tell you, you're talking $25 billion a month in home loans, in new, in new home loans. And I see a lot now about our business. Last month, we processed $3 billion in mum and dad. Home loans, our, and our average home loan's around 
370,000. You know, we're not out there giving 10 million, $5 million loans, so we see it. Um, so you are going to find that APRA will tell the major lenders, cut down on interest only. I think they should ban it full stop. It's different. If you're an owner-occupier, you've got a multi-million dollar house and you're on big uh, packages, that's different. Yeah, that's different. But they, they need to do something about that. Um, in terms of high loan-to-value ratios, APRA's looking at that, and so they should. I don't think there's going to be a much of a change in that. Negative gearing, you know, we need negative gearing, negative gearing has been great, but negative gearing wasn't introduced to allow people to buy properties for tens of millions of dollars and get a 2% yield and write the rest off. Uh, again, governments, federal and state, they haven't really got the guts to go and touch negative gearing, go and touch the family home. Uh, but I, I think, you know, now the talk is, should people be able to tap into, young people be able to tap into their super? Well, I don't think that's a good idea. What's a better idea is the super funds who have trillions of super in their funds, allow some of that to go into financing housing, safe housing, rather than individuals tapping on to what should be their saviour in old age. Because housing is the biggest single asset this country has got. $5.3 trillion in value of housing in this country. All of super is about one and a half trillion. Housing, 5.3 trillion. It's our nest egg. It's our bank account for old age. Our government hasn't got enough money set aside to look after not only an ageing population, but an ageing population who's going to live longer. Low interest rates, they hear fit for years and they'll only ever go up gradually, and I don't believe interest rates will ever get to anywhere near where they used to be because the whole world has adjusted to a low interest rate environment. People won't go shopping now, a lot of places on sale, sale, sale. They're not just gonna turn up the day after and pay double and get sticker shock, they won't do it. Interest rates will not go anywhere near where they used to. The banking sector has adjusted to a fraction of their profit margins than what they used to. When I kicked off in 23 years ago, they used to get as much as 500 basis points, yes, 5% above cost of funds for mum and dad housing, where defaults were the lowest in the Western world and their margins the highest in the Western world. It should be the opposite. That's gone. Banks know that. They've got their act together. Banks are tripping over to retain their existing customers, customers king, and they're tripping over trying to work out how they can win new customers. Credit growth is nowhere near what it has been historically, so the banks are turning on each other to try to woo over their customers. Great for your business. Great for your business. So they've adjusted to accepting that their cash flows has to B, margins down to here, and that will stay. If interest rates go up, it doesn't mean banks are going to get a bigger margin. Where banks do get a break on higher rates is they still get billions of deposits where they pay next to no interest. That's the positive. When interest rates drop, banks do earn less money. They do benefit with lower defaults of loans because interest rates are more affordable. But where they do make, especially the big banks, Commonwealth, Westpac, they have billions of dollars in free money. And um, when rates go up, they get that free money and they might get 4% or 5% instead of 2.5%. But generally speaking, hope that interest rates start to dribble up sooner than later, but they're not gonna dribble up for probably 
18 months, two years or longer, depending on all those global dynamics. Um, and when they start dribbling up, they will be very, very affordable. Hope we get better policy from government. Hope we got governments at state and federal who's got the guts to address the big issues with a fairer tax system to incentivise people, to incentivise workers. Why should a worker go out and do 20 hours overtime when their tax bracket goes up so far they get less per hour for working at 10 o'clock at night? They'd rather be home with their family. I was talking with people the other night. I, I've always thought that at least a third of a new, the cost of a new house is in taxes, all sorts of different taxes. And I was told it's more now closer to 50%. Can you believe that? And is it no wonder where Sydney has got over 200 suburbs where the average price has broken through a million bucks? 200 suburbs. And governments at state, federal levels have never, ever had an orderly strategy for supply of housing to house the growing population. Why is Melbourne and Sydney the housing centres? Well, they're the only two cities where the population is growing. Sydney falls back 20,000 dwellings every year to meet the increased population, 20,000 every year. So it means this year we're going to be 20,000 behind last year's 20,000, behind 20,000 from the year before and the year before and the year before. It's supply and demand. That's why Sydney and Melbourne, particularly Sydney, Melbourne's got more land, Sydney hasn't. But we're buried in bureaucracy and red tape and government doesn't sit back, they just milk the golden goose to get land tax, GST, stamp duties, and it goes on and on and on, but you would think that there would be a supply strategy to ensure that we've got an orderly release of housing, new housing. We know that Sydney and Melbourne increases its population all the time. And what's government doing about it? They'll leave it up to Joe and other developers to get the cycle right. And we know it's all about the cycle. And when the cycle turns, people get burned. Because when things get good, and they're good now in, in mum and dad housing, every man and his dog turns into a developer. Half of the old office buildings in the city, every second building, has got plans being processed to change the office building into residential apartments. There's the potential down the line. Let me tell you, give Aussie a call. At Aussie, we'll save you.